Well, there are just so many things I want to say to you this morning, but the first might be just to say thank you for joining in uh, for worship this Sunday morning. Uh, of course, you know that I'm recording this on Friday. Uh, the timing of things is such that uh, this needs to be done uh, in advance. However, uh, all the spirit is there and all the truth is there and all the sincerity is there as well as we gather together to pray and to worship God together. Today I have some uh, more virtual choir singing for us, uh, interspersed through our worship today. Uh, we'll be using a foreshortened uh, service of morning prayer, and I'll be reading a passage of scripture from uh, the uh, letter of Paul to the Romans. It's a classic uh, section of the scriptures uh, uh, of that particular letter. But before I do, I just wanted uh, there are two or three things I wanted just to sort of uh, talk about. One is about spiritual communion, uh, which is something I'll address in my homily, the notion of how 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 we how we uh, come close to an experience of God or how God draws near to us. And um, there's a lot of conversation about that right now because we can't receive communion. And for many people, that's the only way they know to receive or to draw close to God. No one is suggest that there are other things to think about in that. And, and that's good news for us. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is just a little hymn that uh, uh, speaks about um, in the calamities of life, how God uh ministers to us and uh, so uh, that will be one of the little virtual choirs um it be a solo actually but uh, a wonderful singing of a hymn and i'll talk about that in a second but first i just want to read this passage of scripture uh because i remember how much it meant to me when i was a teenager um and people use this for all kinds of purposes but uh, i just like to hear this passage as a way of remembering and being reminded that God has always had God's eye on me, that God has always had God's eye on you, and that uh, uh, you're very important to God. But from the 39th Psalm, 139th Psalm, for you yourself created my inmost parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful, and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. They were fashioned day by day, when as yet there was none of them. How deep I find your thoughts, O God, how great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. I find that always encouraging to imagine that uh, God sees us. Uh, and reading that, uh, uh, that God sees us and, uh, and loves us. Uh, and that there's no mistake about us. And um, I think that's powerful. It was powerful for me when I was a teenager, trying to figure it and sort out my world. Um, so I'm grateful for that passage of scripture and I hope you find that a blessing as well. Um, I also wanted just to uh, speak for a minute about this first hymn that we're going to uh, be hearing. It is well with my soul. I know you'll know that hymn. Uh, we've sung it here at St. Luke's many, many times. There's a great story behind it. I'll tell you a brief part of it in a few minutes. But, uh, but before I do, I want to just speak about um, this whole notion of uh, spiritual communion. Uh, it happens that I speak to you today, this Friday, is the transferred feast of uh, St. Thomas, who used to be December the 21st, the doubting Thomas, the darkest day of the year, right? So no light at all, Thomas seen as the, the, the one in the dark in some sense. And yet he asks the honest question uh, because he'd spent some time with Jesus. And uh, in the time he spent with Jesus, he discovered that this faith that he was talking about was was not just an esoteric faith of the mind or some uh, attitude of the heart, but it had very practical consequences uh, of taste and touch and smell and doing and being in the world that God created. And God loves so much that God wants to redeem it. So Jesus comes along and, and Thomas was with him. And so he struggles in the uh, post-resurrection appearances to believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. He wants to know for sure. And so Jesus comes along and says, you know, handle my hands, look at, put your fingers in the, in the holes in my hands, look at my side, uh, don't know more, but believe. And, and we know as that story goes that 
uh, he does. But, you know, it's particularly important for us because we're wondering about what it means to uh, have spiritual communion. This Sunday morning, I'll celebrate the Eucharist under restrictions. And that will mean that, for example, uh, although people will be present for the entire service, no one will be allowed to receive. So in the midst of that, uh, people begin to talk about spiritual communion. And I'm curious about what people mean about that. And I want to reflect on that uh, from my own understanding of what spiritual communion is, how we draw close to God. Uh, but first, I wanted just to offer you this poem by Malcolm Geith. And I'll, I'll let Malcolm Geith read it again. It's, uh, I believe, in Sounding the Seasons. Uh, it's one of his Saints' Day sonnets for uh, Doubting Thomas. It's called Doubting Thomas, but uh, it's very powerful. And so just listen to the language because, you know, he speaks about uh, the very tactile nature of our faith. That It's not just disembodied, but uh, in uh, a very literal sense, very real. Uh, and, and should be, uh, the best faith probably should be, in some sense, very real and connected to the world that God creates. So listen to, his, uh, listen to him as he reads this, this uh, poem, Touching the Wounds, it's called, uh, St. Thomas the Apostle. We do not know. How can we know the way? Courageous master of the awkward question. You spoke the words the others dared not say and cut through their evasion and abstraction. O oh, doubting Thomas, father of my faith, you put your finger on the nub of things. We cannot love some disembodied wraith, but flesh and blood must be our king of kings. Your teaching is to touch, embrace, anoint, feel after him and find him in the flesh. Because he loved your awkward counterpoint, the word has heard and granted you your wish. O oh, place my hands with yours. Help me divine the wounded God whose wounds are healing mine. Now may the word. Then he goes on to preach a sermon. Uh, you can find that easily by just doing a little search of Malcolm Guy, and it's well worth listening to him. Uh, he's uh, wonderful, but, uh, and I just find that uh, that particular poem uh, so inspiring. And so uh, I hope that you do as well. So now we don't want to start our worship uh, service, and uh, for worship this morning, we'll have a foreshortened service of morning prayer, which will include three uh, virtual hymns and uh, a passage of scripture, a confession at the beginning, uh, and some comfortable words from the scriptures to remind us of God's love and then a homily and some prayers following, and then a concluding hymn of blessing. Uh, so um, I want to start with this uh, hymn that um, I know you'll know. Uh, it's a, a hymn that was written by Horatio Spafford, uh, I think in 1870, well, sometime in the 1870s, I would say. Uh, it is well with my soul. He has an interesting story. There are many apocryphal stories about how this came about and so on, but among other things, he was a very successful person in Chicago. During uh, the great fire in Chicago, he lost most of his wealth. And then uh, because he was a friend of, Saint, uh, of Moody, uh, the great preacher from Chicago, he and his family went to uh, England uh, for some evangelistic uh, services and to support uh, Mr. Moody. His wife and children uh, set off to go back to Chicago and uh, in, or maybe were making their way to uh, England. And there was a, a terrible accident at sea in the middle of the Atlantic, and all the children were killed. Uh, years later, other tragedies would follow. But in all of that, uh, Horatio Spafford was able to write uh, from his confidence in the love of God and trust in God, a wonderful hymn that we have belted out for over a century now. Uh, because it's so wonderful. It is well with my soul. And so I want to share that with you this morning. 
um, as a beautiful hymn to begin and for us to reflect on how we may come to trust in God and achieve a kind of spiritual communion uh, with God through Jesus Christ. And so um, we begin with it as well with my soul. soul i think there's just such a wonderful 
him and I pray that it is well with your soul today, uh, with all our souls as we continue in what seems like such a uh, uh, such a terrible time of pandemic, even with the openings uh, here in the United States, of course, there are uh, upticks in uh, infections and so on. So we're praying for people today. I want to remember that there's not only bad news, there's good news. And the good news comes to us in the words of scripture today. I want to uh, begin with a reading or two of uh, sentences of scripture that uh, assure us of God's presence in the world and in our lives. That we're not abandoned and left unto ourselves. And that God is with us. And so we begin. The hour is coming now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and with the one also who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. Dear friends, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are requisite and necessary for our life and for our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us pause now in silence, and with penitent and obedient hearts, confess our sins turning toward God. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And Almighty God, grant unto your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I want to read to you this morning a passage from the 145th Psalm. The psalmist writes, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, of great kindness. The Lord is loving to everyone. His compassion is over all his works. All your works praise you, O Lord. Your faithful servants bless you. They make known the glory of your kingdom and speak of your power that the peoples may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all ages. The Lord is faithful in all his words and merciful in all his deeds. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. May God add a blessing to the reading of that psalm. The first passage of scripture I wish to read this morning is from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, in the seventh chapter beginning at the 15th verse. And this uh, passage you will recognize perhaps is the place from which the Book of Common Prayer takes the confession uh, that we just prayed uh, this morning. The thing I want to do is the thing I, I cannot do, the thing I I do not wish to do, I find myself always doing, uh, and there is no health in me. Uh, and then we find the answer to that dilemma in these very words. So here's how uh, it goes. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that Nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. 
for I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from the body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. And here ends the first lesson. I want to share with you another uh, piece of music that I think you'll find uh, inspirational as well today. This one is entitled, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. The second lesson of scripture for this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, the 11th chapter, beginning at the 16th verse. 
uh, I might just say a very odd little reading of scripture, but uh, uh, one that uh, comes to us today. But to what will I compare this generation, Jesus says? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And here ends the second lesson. I invite you to join with me as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I just want to point out at the beginning of the homily, those just last words, take my yoke upon you. Come to me, all you that are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. It's a great old hymn we used to sing in church uh, with those words, come unto me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. It was just such a wonderful uh, hymn, and uh, it speaks of the, uh, it takes up these uh, words from, of Jesus from Matthew chapter 11. They're powerful for us uh, as we uh, contemplate um, our world these days and the need, in a way, um, to find rest in God. So I just wanted to draw those to your attention. There has been a lot of discussion in the church world these days about when we can resume receiving Holy Communion. For many in the liturgical world, communion can represent one of those few tangible certifications that God is drawing near to us with bread in hand and wine in the chalice. We communicate with God. With the absence, though, of Holy Communion, the question arises, how then shall we know closeness to God? Some want to borrow from this notion of spiritual communion, a concept that St. Augustine would be familiar with, but I don't think we really are uh, these days, that the desire for communion in some ways imparts the benefit of communion to the person who longs to receive but cannot. Not sure how that may sit with you. I have a problem with it from two perspectives. First, I wonder then about all those folks who aren't sacramental and who wish to know closeness to God. Is there another way? Uh, and second, I find it hard to accept that bread and wine could be the only way that we as Anglicans or as Episcopalians could know closeness to God. So I want to offer some different thoughts about the idea of spiritual communion because I do think it's a very important reality of the Christian life. And I think we ought to know how to come close to God, or how God comes close to us. Last week, someone took me aside after the service and asked to hear what happened to me at 15 that marked a turning point and a beginning of faith. I often speak of that 
uh, in sermons, but I guess probably I've never really spelled it out in specific detail. But it strikes me that this may help us to configure our thinking about the depth of meaning that exists in the idea of a spiritual communion. communion. So let me say simply this, that the first time I tasted Jesus, it was not at a communion rail. It was on a sawdust trail. Do you know what I mean by a sawdust trail? It's an expression often connected to the evangelical tradition of the church, and especially the great revival meetings that erupted in the American frontiers, and then, of course, overseas as well. We know I spoke about this earlier that uh, Moody went to England to preach, uh, and there were plenty of sawdust trails there as well. Billy Sunday used the expression so often as a reference to the sawdust that would be put down on the floors of tabernacles, places of meeting where he would hold his meetings, to dampen the noise of shuffling feet and the dust of days gone by. You would hit the sawdust trail when, at the end of the service, at the invitation, you would walk down the center aisle and shake the hand of the preacher. That action signified the making of a public statement of your repentance and turn toward Jesus. I've been going in this direction. I've decided now to go in this direction. I have celebrated and received the Lord's Supper in countless ways and under so many circumstances, all of them beautiful, I think, you know, in their own way. But let me tell you that seldom have I tasted Jesus in a more nourishing and life-changing way than I did that first night on a sinner's sawdust trail. I believe it was 1980. There was no bread there. There was no wine in sight. There was only one frank declaration of belief and faith and of repentance in response to a call of Jesus on my life, a call based on his love for me, a love that I did not earn. That's the story that I heard that night, and I wanted that love. The passage of scripture comes to mind when you were dead in your trespasses and sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. I've spent the remainder of my life trying to live toward, or perhaps I might better say, surrender to that loving call that I heard that first night, and perhaps just in the nick of time. This, for me, was my first spiritual communion, but before long, it would need some structure in order for the experience, as glorious and life-changing as it was, to be lasting, which is why I am an Anglican and now a priest, well, an Episcopalian and now a priest. In this tradition, of which the Episcopal Church is a part, we have a remarkable vision and system laid before us from which we are able to receive grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy, in the regular practice of reading the scriptures, of making our confession, and celebrating the sacraments of Christ as Christ ordained them, baptism and Holy Communion. All of these are sources of our spiritual communion, all ways in which we come to eat and drink deeply of Jesus. But not one of them is better than another. Not least is the Sacrament of Holy Communion, though, of course, uh, but perhaps not for the reason that you think. Yes, the bread and wine are central components of the Supper of the Lord, but they need mean nothing without the words of institution unfailingly used. You'll hear this every time you come to church and communion is celebrated. This is my body. This is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death until he come again. These are not important because they are the magic words that change bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus. These words are instead the declaration and the constant reminder that the benefits of Holy Communion are found in the work of the cross. And each time we receive, we are recalling our own union with that work on the cross of repentance and turn toward Jesus, like that sawdust trail. So in baptism, Paul reminds us that we die and then rise with Christ, and all our spiritual communion is found in the way this truth nourishes us as we become more and more the body of Christ and are drawn more deeply into the love of God. This is the provenance of spiritual communion, union with the one who died and rose again. 
think of those words that we speak so plainly in the faith that we confess. We do not say, Alleluia, bread has been transformed and wine has now changed. No, we say, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. We are remembering in the Lord's Supper that we are being ever united with the risen Christ through the work that he has done on our behalf on Calvary, even as we look for his coming. But we do not need bread and wine in order to remember this. When a pandemic prevents us from receiving the elements, we still know that in our baptism we are united in Christ. When we're ill, we still know that Christ is with us and does not abandon us. And this we know because we are confident that spiritual communion comes to us because of the love Jesus has expressed for us from the cross, not by anything or transaction that we do. So if this is the case, you might wonder then why we would ever need to return to the bread and the wine, to the Lord's Supper. And the answer to this is very simple. The Lord's Supper is a commandment instituted by Jesus. Do this in remembrance of me. It is attested to in the Synoptic Gospels. It's taught in the sixth chapter of John. And more to it, it's practiced in the earliest church. Paul memorializes its central importance in his first letter to the church in Corinth, some of the earliest writing of the New Testament. So the Lord's Supper is not optional. It is rather the way that we keep before us a remembrance of the work of the cross and the resurrection when we meet on the Lord's day, the day in which we celebrate resurrection. That's what every Sunday is, a day of resurrection. In this thinking, whether we eat and drink or not, we may still receive in a spiritual manner. And not by any effort or work that we do, because, but because Jesus did the work for us on the cross. And each time we turn to Jesus confessing our sin, even as we think of his saving work on the cross, we are brought in to communion with him. And that is true when we say morning prayer, or even song, or compline, or simply pray on a rock as we look out across the ocean. In all those places, we can call that to memory and there be in true communion with God. This morning, this Sunday morning, I should say, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper, knowing all the while that we may not kneel and there make a throne with our hands to receive Jesus as Lord. There are many reasons to wish to worship in this way, including a longing to return to the familiar or an appreciation for what we are accustomed to, or a search for a sense of the normal, and likely so many other reasons as well. And it's appropriate for us to long to taste in our senses the supper, like that poem uh, that Guy uh, read for us, that Malcolm Guy read for us this morning, talking about Thomas not worshiping some disembodied wraith, but something real, right? That it's okay that we want uh, to taste in our senses the supper because it makes our faith become sight to us. But let it also, and perhaps most importantly, be a reminder that the bread and the wine being sacraments point to something beyond themselves. The greater truth is ours as we recall Jesus' saving work for us on the cross, in which we can do wherever we are, sacrament or not, by calling to mind the benefits of Good Friday. Someday, and likely soon, we will be able to return to full communion, but do not be discouraged or believe that without the supper of the Lord, we are cut off from God. That too is just magical thinking. St. Paul tells us, although we see now through a glass darkly, when we see him, we shall be like him, which is the goal of all spiritual communion and will be our joy when the sacraments cease, because they will when we see Jesus. But if you wish for spiritual communion, simply today, recall his saving work on the cross for you. And simply ask that you may join him in his death and resurrection. 
Now, the words of a good friend of ours and a faithful friend of ours, ours, Father Jim, are helpful here. I asked him the quest, a question about spiritual communion this week. He wrote back something that's just quite beautiful. I want to share it with you because it helps us to frame our thinking as well about uh, this notion of spiritual communion. Pondering this question, he wrote uh, the following to me. And it's a bit like a, a, a part of a sermon. What do you want when you come to a Eucharist? Do you want this time to be for hearing nice music or seeing friends or sitting quietly or for spiritual insights to be given in a homily? If you've come they, for these reasons, there is no need for a Eucharist. You can have any of those things without a Eucharist. But if you've come because you want God to be present in your life, if you desire to participate in remembering that someone loved you so much they, they died for you, and I don't mean remembering like trying to remember where you left your car keys, but remembering like you remember those times in your life that were so significant that in the remembering, a smile comes to your face again or a tear rolls down your cheek again, or remembering when you are caught up in that past moment, which is real enough to you that now again is real and present. A Eucharist rem Eucharistic remembering which tells you again that God's love of sacrifice is because you are, are loved. And you desire to know that love again by means of the sacrament so that your life will again this week be converted by love so that you may love. If you, dear parishioner, want this, then spiritual communion and the work of preparing the table and leading the prayers so that the sacrament is made present to us in this parish makes sense. If you don't desire to commune with God in this sacramental way, in this remembering of Christ's act of love, then there is no need for spiritual communion or any communion at all to be celebrated here. I think those are beautiful words because they encapsulate just the sense of the distinction of what it means to desire spiritual communion with God through Christ our Lord. So I pray that you find that this week. And I pray that you find that in those wonderful words, to be converted by love so that you may love. Amen. I'd like to lead us in a few prayers uh, before we conclude our worship this morning. And to begin, I invite you to pray with me wherever you are with confidence. The words that were taught to us by the one who loved us so much that he died for us, Jesus. Who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Collect for Pentecost 5. Let us pray. O oh God, you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And we call it for the fourth Sunday after Trinity. Let us pray. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In our intercessions today, I would ask your prayers uh, for 
some folks and for some concerns and some intentions that uh, I might bring up. But I just also invite you to lift up your own intentions, either silently or aloud, and then lift them to the Lord as we pray the prayer uh, for all sorts and conditions of people. So I ask your prayers today for our Bishop Mark. We pray for strength for him and for rest and courage and confidence as he offers leadership and takes responsibility for the life of the diocese. We pray for those who support him to include all the, the clergy of this diocese and all the people of this diocese in each parish. I ask your prayers for those who are worshiping together uh, in this week and especially this coming Sunday, the Lord's Day. I ask your prayers as well for those who have been affected by this terrible pandemic. We pray for people who are still becoming ill. We pray for uh, the leaders of our states. We give thanks in a particular way for our governor, Mike DeWine, and for his efforts and the efforts of those who work with him to um, slow the curve and uh, to uh, uh, lead us in the direction of health and well-being. ask your prayers for our parish family. We pray for people in this parish who are shot in today, who have been shot in for months, especially our seniors. We pray as well for their families, for those who have been deprived the ability to visit, and a, an abundance of caution, not wanting to infect loved ones. Give thanks for courageous people who show leadership in wearing masks in public who show their love and express their love by that simple act. I ask your prayers for those who have asked for our prayers. They include Jeanette, Troy, Charlie, Mary, Robert, Amber, and family who are in sorrow at this time. For William, Neil, Kathy, Rebecca, Donald, Emma, Bob, Dorothy, Thelma, Shirley, Georgia, Joan, Barb, Donna, Pastor Tim, the May family, Joanna, Callie, Jan, Joe, Barb, and all others who you may now wish to lift up, either silently or aloud. We pray for Josh, Kathleen, and Christopher, and those whom they love. We pray for Martin, for Andrea, and Roger, Mark, and Ann, and all whom they love. Let us pray. O God, the creator and preserver of all humankind, we humbly beseech you for all people everywhere and in their circumstance that you would be pleased to make your ways known to them, your saving health to all nations. More especially, we pray for your holy church, universal, that it may be so guided and governed by your good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christian may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit and the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. And finally, we commend to your fatherly goodness all those who are in any way afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, that it may please you to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their suffering and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ, his sake. Amen. And in thanksgiving, I want to lift up the names of two people. Uh, uh, Father James McCorston, Father Gary Thorne, and for their faithfulness uh, and for their encouragement in my ministry. And I pray for them and for their safety and their peace and their well-being and for the well-being of all those whom they love. We give thanks for the beauty of the summertime and pray for an opportunity to enjoy the benefits of uh, the summer season. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we are unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service 
and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, world without end. Amen. We finally conclude our prayers and sum them all up with the prayer of St. Chrysostom. And I invite you, if you know it, to pray with me. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. You have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. And now may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. And may you this week know the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our final hymn of worship. I played uh, versions of this before. It's called The Blessing Around the Globe, Better Land Worship Initiative. And I offer this as a final blessing for us all today.
children and their children and their children. I just love that song. You could, uh, I could listen to it uh, minute by minute uh, because the message is so strong, especially on the, the constant refrain, he is for you, he is for you. Don't listen to the voices that tell you you're alone. He is for you, he is with you. Uh, and let's give thanks for that. I say that with confidence, even as I ask you, you know, on the third anniversary of my sister's passing away, of your charity to pray with me, uh, for the repose of her soul. Let us pray. You seem to give them back to thee, O God, who gave us them to us, yet as thou didst not lose them in giving, so we do not lose them by their return. Not, not as the world giveth, givest thou, O lover of souls, but thou givest, thou takest not away. For what is thine is ours also, if we are thine. And life is eternal, and love is immortal, and death is only an horizon. And an horizon is nothing save the limit of our sight. Lift us up, strong Son of God, that we may see further. Cleanse our eyes that we may see more clearly. Draw us closer to thyself, that we may know ourselves to be nearer to our loved ones who are with thee. And while thou dost prepare a place for us, prepare us also for that happy place, that where thou art we may be also and forevermore. Amen. May God richly bless you this week. Amen. <laughs>